Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome on behalf of myself and Yaris and Rick. We are co-hosts here and we'll be having some short talks and plenty of time for discussion, question and answers between them. Uh, the schedule is on, on the website and we have the chat channel workshop high performance data access for DASC. It's a, a long thing, but you'll find it. And uh, the first section will be on tabular data, and we can go straight to Rick. That sounds good. I'll share my screen. It usually takes me two tries. Are we on my slides? First try. Yeah. Excellent. I'm on fire. All right. Cool. So, yeah, my name is Rick Zamora. I'm uh, an engineer at NVIDIA. Um, thank you all for joining today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're going to start by talking about Parquet and Dask. It's going to be a high level overview. I'm going to talk about some performance considerations and some future work, but it's not going to go into too many details, but we could discuss details later on if you guys are interested. All right. So first of all, what is Parquet? Uh, generally, Parquet is a binary columnar storage format designed with parallelism and coding compression in mind. Uh, when you imagine a Parquet data set, you should imagine a collection of Parquet files. They might be partitioned by directory, but for simplicity's sake, let's just say it's a collection of Parquet files. Each Parquet file is going to um, comprise a collection of row groups. Each row group is going to comprise a collection of column chunks. These are contiguously stored data for each chunk. And each of these chunks will be break it, broken into pages. Uh, you can think of the task or the map reduced level of parallelism occurring over different files or different row groups. The IO parallelism is typically over column chunks and or pages and the encoding will be, uh, the coding and uh, compression will typically be over pages um, at, a, at the page granularity at least. Uh, so each file also contains something called footer metadata. This is just going to specify all of the row groups, the column chunks. It's also going to contain other statistics about the column chunks like the max value, min value, things like that. And so a side note, because I just mentioned this Parquet metadata, it actually is pretty important, especially in Dask. Uh, it's not within the Parquet specification that there needs to be a, a, what we call a global metadata file. I'll typically call it underscore metadata, uh, but Dask definitely likes to have this on the read side. So by default, we, we produce one on the right side. All this is, is if you take all the file, the footer metadata from every file in your data set and you aggregate it together in the one place, uh, this is, more performant on the read parquet side because you know what you're doing in read parquet is you're doing the planning stage of figuring out where all the pieces are on your client. And if the client has to go through and read all the metadata from lots of different files, this could be slow, especially in a remote file system. Um, there are other ways we can get around this but doing things in parallel, but for now it's just fastest if we have a global metadata file. And so the DAS parquet API, what does it look like? Again, I said this is going to be at a high level. I'm just kind of showing a picture of what the par what the read parquet and two parquet APIs look like. There are lots of different options here. Uh, usage for read parquet is going to be simple. You know, import DAS data frame, call DAS data frame dot read parquet, and point it to some file source or data source. Uh, two parquet is just the opposite. If you already have a DAS collection like DDF, you call two parquet and point it to the directory you want to write everything to. Another thing to keep in mind though, is over the past couple of years, we've done some development in both the read and write parquet, or it's a two and <laughs> read parquet and two parquet, uh, so that everything actually has what we would call a pluggable engine um, backend. And so right now, if you are specifying engine equals pi arrow, you'll get um, at the arrow leg legacy engine backend. If you specify pi arrow data set, you'll get the arrow data set engine backend. Uh, there's also the fast parquet engine. And the reason I say this is pluggable is, you know, in Dask QDF, what we actually do is we just inherit from the arrow backend and then just call it QDF engine. And we are just using the Dask data frame, um, read parquet and write part and to parquet, but just specifying, we want the engine to be QDF engine. So this is interesting to keep in mind. You could, you know, this is customizable. So some, you know, options and performance considerations to consider in to parquet. I'm not going to go through all these different options. I'm just calling out some of the more important ones. They're all kind of important in one way or another. The ones that I have highlighted in orange are ones I'm actually going to go into detail about here. So actually, I'm just going to jump right in. So first of all, compression. Um, the default compression, 
I, I think when you read the docs, it says it depends on the back end, but it is generally just snappy. So uh, snappy is typically a pretty fast option. Uh, it's not always the most space efficient and there might be faster options, right? So these, this is something you can play with. Uh, also, it's important to keep in mind that the, the best compression option is not it is, it can be column specific, right? You have lots of different data types in your data set. Maybe you wanna specify different compression types for different columns. Uh, this is totally doable in Parquet. And so you just pass through a dictionary to specify this. Like if you want column A to have snappy, column B to have gzip, you would just do something like this. And then there's partitioning. So Dask allows you to do Hive-like directory partitioning. You would just specify some column or a list of columns to the partition on option. And this would effectively mean that when you're writing out your data set, for each partition, you're going to decompose that partition into different and write to different directories, depending on the value of you know, the category of the columns that you are that you've listed in partition on. This can be really useful from a workflow perspective. And in the future, hopefully it will be much faster. But right now, um, DAS doesn't do a great job of reading this back. And the reason is that we don't do a good job of aggregating small files together yet. Uh, so what you're effectively gonna do is read in a lots of small files into distinct partitions, and you're gonna do a lot of file accesses and small file reads. And this is typically not anywhere as fast as it should be yet. So um, there's better support on the way and the chunk size option, I'll get to that later. Also write metadata file. I already mentioned before that it can be important to have a global metadata file in Parquet uh, or in Dask. Um, Sometimes, you know, it usually makes sense just to leave this default true. Uh, sometimes if you have a constrained uh, worker that needs to write this file, you can run into problems because there is there does there does need to be one worker in the end that's going to aggregate the metadata, which could be gigabytes in size and write that to disk. Um, you can always specify this to false and you can use the create metadata file utility to, cre to create a metadata file after the fact if this is more convenient. And so some uh, overview and some considerations for read parquet. Again, these are a bunch of different options. I'm not going to read through. I'm going to focus on the the highlight the, the points that are highlighted in orange. So first of all, I'm going to group these together, specifying columns and filters. Something beautiful about parquet is we can do partial I/O. We don't have to read an entire file and then pick out the pieces we need. Um, if you specify columns, we will only go through and read the specific column chunks that correspond to those columns. If you specify some kind of predicate filters, we can actually go through the and, and look at the statistics, the, the, the uh, Parquet metadata statistics, and flush out all of or filter out all of the row groups that don't meet, match our filter. If you're using the Pyro dataset API, actually the filtering will happen both at the row group level and then during I/O time there will be row-wise filtering. But just to keep in mind. For now, this is the Pyro data sets, the only option where you'll get row-wise filtering. When you specify a filter, it's just going to be, um, um, the, the granularity of filtering is just gonna be at the row group level. Uh, index, uh, this is kind of uh, something that I don't think people keep in mind that often. Uh, by default, what we do in Dask is we look at the pandas metadata, uh, special, special key value metadata called pandas metadata. We see, is there an index column that's been specified? Um, if not, or, you know, Otherwise, it's not actually otherwise. The default is if index is specified to something explicit by the user, then we'll use that as the, as the index column. But something to keep in mind is when we do have an index column, what we do is we look at all, we parse all the statistics in the metadata and we try to calculate divisions. This does have overhead on the client during the planning stage of the read parquet. So if you know you don't need divisions, you don't need an index, it can be fast as just to set index to false explicitly. So just keep that in mind. And then split row groups. This is an important option in Read Parquet because right now this is really the, the, the main way we choose how we're partitioning um, our output collection. We read in the files. Uh, right now, by default, we will split, we'll take each row group in the data set and that will become one of our output partitions. Uh, we can set split row groups equal to false. And then instead of doing that, we will just partition by file. Or you can specify a, an integer value to split row groups. And then we'll, we'll, like, let's say it's two, then each output partition will be two row groups at a time. Something to keep in mind is this aggregation only happens within files. So if each of your files is just one row group, then it doesn't really matter what you set for split row groups. It's always going to be the same. It's going to be one partition per file. So some recent improvements and some plans for the future. Uh, first, I'll just talk about some recent improvements. Something that's nice is Read Parquet is now 
you know, constructing what's called a blockwise high level graph layer under the hood. You don't really need to know anything about blockwise or what, what high level graph layers are, but I can just kind of celebrate something that happens now is let's say there's an example where you read parquet and you select, or you, you, you know, select a column. This is called a get item op operation. And then you add something. So you're doing something on every single partition, you're adding a value or adding a, an integer. So for high level graph, um, what this looks like is you just have three layers. For a full task graph, which people usually are more familiar with, is you know for each of your partitions. Let's say there's two partitions in your data set. You're going to read parquet. You're going to get. You're going to select the column X. You're going to add a value to the, or add one to it. Uh, at the high level, we don't actually need to to um, materialize all of this graph. Everything here, we can just say we're reading parquet. We have some number of partitions. We're get it, we're, we're calling get M on all those partitions, and we're adding all of them. And so now, since um, reparquet is a blockwise operation, something blockwise is already designed to do is it does a high level, pa a high level optimization pass where it can just fuse all these optim operations together without actually materializing the graph at all. And so we automatically get a, a lot of optimizations just by moving reparquet into blockwise. Something else that um, is ongoing right now is, like I mentioned before, um, partitioning or, or aggregating many small files together. Uh, I didn't mention there's a chunk size op option. And the reason I didn't mention that is because it's been historically pretty um, inefficient because it relies on uh, metadata statistics. It still will in the future rely on some metadata statistics, but the performance has improved. And the thing that I'm hoping that I'm working on now is an ability to specify that you don't just want to aggregate within file. Maybe you want to aggregate row groups or between row groups and files, or maybe many files within, within specific directory structures. And this is really useful for when you have a partition data set, you know, just from preliminary testing, this example with 36,000 partitions, it goes from four, point, four and a half minutes down to 30 seconds on my machine. And so I think this is, this is really exciting for me. Um, maybe others will be excited too. <laughs> the last thing I'm just gonna mention something to do right now in um, Reparquet, if you do something like Reparquet and then immediately after select some columns, what we get in a high level, like I, I mentioned high level graphs, there's a high level graph pass and what we get is something called the get item optimization. This selection is actually pushed into the read parquet call and it becomes a columns, uh, um, uh, yeah, a columns argument. And this is great, but the problem is it only works if the get item operation comes immediately after read parquet. The work that I'm, I'm hoping to do in the immediately near future is to allow this to happen, you know, even when the get item operation happens after some number of of um, operations after the reparquet has occurred. So I call that like multi-layer column projection. Also, there's predicate pushdown. This is not available yet in any form yet, but there's no reason it can't be. Uh, the idea is, let's say you read parquet, you specify some filters. Uh, there's no reason that those predicates can't be pushed down into the filters argument in reparquet. And so this is something that I, um, I'm in the process of looking into and happy to get feedback and other people interested. And so with that, I'll just say thank you. I know that was a quick, a high level, I probably actually took too much time, even though I was trying to go fast, but feel free to ask questions uh, later on. Thank you very much. Um, we will move straight on to Yoris and then have questions about Parquet and tabular data sets in general afterwards. And that will be a nice long session. So if you can please hold your questions until then. Over to you, Yoris. Yeah. Do you see the full slides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi all. Um, I'm uh, Yuri Sandomboso. I'm uh, working at Versa Computing on Apache Arrow. Um, Rick already mentioned Arrow um, as one of the engines for the the read parquet um, functionality in Dusk. But so I want to um, explain a bit more and tell a bit about uh, what we have been working on, uh, specifically related to uh, data sets, uh, reading, scanning in uh, Apache Arrow. So my slides actually won't um, mention Dask a lot, um, but it are um, things that are used under the hood in Dask potentially. Uh, or can be used or are useful or interesting for uh, DAS users. Um, so very short, um, 
I'm not going in, into details here, but uh, for those not very familiar with Apache Arrow, um, so it's you can basically say there are two and there are diff different aspects about the Apache Arrow project. Uh, on the one hand, it's a set of open standards and specifications for in-memory uh, columnar data uh, and specifications about how to, uh, how to uh, transfer such data, how to, uh, for example, in, in inter-process communication uh, and things like that. On the other hand, there are also a bunch of libraries implementing those standards and providing a whole set of tools. And that's uh, probably one of the, the, uh, the, the ways that most people actually interact with Apache Arrow under the hood is through the Parquet uh, IO implementation that is exposed in, in, in Pandas or in, in Dask. Um, so we, we already had uh, for quite a long time, uh, so this, this Parquet implementation and uh, also, uh, so it can read Parquet files and write uh, Parquet files also uh, read partitioned uh, Parquet files written in Python. Uh, but the last two years, we uh, tried to generalize uh, this concept of a, of a Parquet data set. Um, so, um, and this has become the Arrow data set project. So it's the goal here is to any kind of data source to have a unified interface to um, scan, uh, read data from uh, such data source. So the goal is to support uh, different file systems or um, uh, servers where or connections for database connection could in principle also be supported. Currently it's not the case, but um, the different file systems, local uh, S3 are already supported, different file formats. Um, and then we provide functionality to um, construct a data set. For example, if you give a directory uh, of partition data, we will figure out all the, the fragments and just as, as Dusk uh, will do for you, um, different partitioning um, uh, schemes, inferring the schema. Um, and then when scanning, there are a whole bunch of um, optimizations for projecting, selecting columns, doing filtering while scanning, uh, etc. cetera. Um, a bit of terminology here. So, the data sets, they consist of fragments. Um, typically, a fragment can, for example, map to a single uh, file within a partitioned uh, parquet data set, but it depends a bit. Those fragments, data sets can be scanned. Uh, and so we get a stream of record bytes um, out of that. So we have a Python API in, in PyArrow. Um, so here is a small example uh, showing um, like you can how to construct the data sets um, to scan it, to scan it to a full table, um, giving a projecting filtering options, um, etc. But um, so uh, for Dask users, this is what uh, Dask, the or at least the Parquet engine in Dask, uh, actually uses under the hood. Um, this is also a generic API, but for there are some specializations for Parquet. Um, so the, the Parquet engine um, will be able to uh, look at the fragments. There is some functionality to get the metadata, metadata of the fragments, the statistics to uh, split um, in row groups, is something that um, Rick, Rick mentioned that one of the, the things you can play with um, uh, for performance, whether you want to split or, or rather combine row groups. Uh, so those functionalities are uh, available in, in the data sets uh, project. Um, for the rest, I'm going to talk uh, just purely about the data set project, but in, in the Arrow project itself, um, it, there is also a bit of bigger picture where the data sets, uh, I, the scanning, filtering, uh, will become part of uh, a larger query engine uh, execution. Um, yeah, so that was that. Um, some recent or relatively recent last year improvements. Um, so Park and Federer are already supported, but now you can also, uh, if you have a CSV files or a partitioned CSV um, data sets uh, that can also be read. Um, we 
uh, support now more uh, more forms of schema evolution. I know that there has have been some issues in uh, reported to Dask when uh, different parquet files of your data set has have slightly different uh, schemas that that there are errors. So there uh, that should be more flexible now. Um, for example, if you have a in 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 one uh, like in 32 or in 64, we'll just uh, upcast uh, those um, when needed. Um, there have been improvements in, in uh, specifically for reading parquet files, for example, uh, making the, the parsing of statistics more lazily, um, some improvements to file systems. Uh, we can also write data sets now, not only read, although I think for Dask that's a bit less relevant. Um, and then a few others that I will uh, directly go into more detail. And the last one here is also that uh, there is uh, currently our colleague of mine, uh, David Lee is working on uh, a tracing infrastructure that you can uh, get a much more like, um, yeah, analyze uh, behavior and performance in, in complex uh, workloads using the open telemetry um, infrastructure. Um, but so, um, one other um, new feature um, is custom projections. This, uh, this part, I'm also not um, that sure how directly applicable it's for Dask. Um, but so you could already select a subset of columns, as Rick mentioned, important if you want to uh, reduce uh, the, the reading of, of columns that you don't need. Um, now you can uh, also, while scanning, already uh, apply some expression on some uh, um, expression on those columns. Um, I gave here a, a few examples. The API is certainly not yet ideal. Uh, this is the, the low-level API that is currently available, but uh, we're still working on that. Uh, but you can provide a dictionary saying, for example, um, I want to. Um, materialize my, my scanned data sets uh, directly as, for example, dividing column A uh, with column B instead of uh, materializing uh, for the full data set in both columns and afterwards doing the division. We could do that while uh, scanning and, and avoid materializing uh, both full columns. Um, or, yeah, any other expression that is supported uh, by the uh, uh, API. Um, Another um, more important feature that um, uh, also specifically David has been working on is uh, pre-buffering uh, and then specifically for parquet files. So uh, with pre-buffering, um, what's being done is that um, based on the, uh, the information we know about the parquet files, based on the metadata, uh, we know which row groups or which columns um, column chunks we uh, need to read. Um, and we'll try to coalesce those uh, so we can do fewer uh, read operations. And especially for um, file systems like S3 with a high latency, it's, uh, this can be very uh, useful to improve for performance to um, reduce the number of um, uh, requests. Uh, so I have here a small example I run on on, uh, on Amazon, so it's a single, uh, it's a taxi data set file for one month. Um, without so the the default um, for now, and with uh, pre buffering, and you can see so it went down from twenty one seconds to three seconds um, by using this uh, pre buffer option. So that's a yeah a very important in, improvement specifically for. Um, the, the uh, data sets um, when working with uh, file systems like S3. Um, here, I'm so th this is what I'm showing here is with the um, the file system, uh, our own implementation in uh, Apache Arrow. Uh, but um, so I'm not fully sure how, and, and that's certainly something to figure out how it would interact with um, how Dask uses the FSPEC uh, file system. Um, I know that S3FS already does some read ahead itself. We have been doing some benchmarks that 
might show that um, doing the read ahead from S3FS and the pre-buffering uh, together actually make things worse. But um, yeah, that's something to further investigate. I uh, was not confident enough how those benchmarks to put them on the slides, but um, that's something to uh, figure out uh, further. More in general, we also have been working on um, async, uh, async operations uh, to have separate IO and, 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 and CPU thread pools. Um, and also here specifically for um, S3. So, so on the left is for a local file system where there is not really any benefit, but also no, uh, not much of a slowdown. But specifically for S3, uh, you see that the, the combination of both using the async uh, scanning and using the pre-buffering uh, gives a, a, a very uh, big improvement. This is not yet in the release version. The pre-buffering is actually already uh, available. Um, I'm running out of time. So there are also a few new um, coming in the next version, uh, some new convenience methods. Uh, you can, um, for example, we take select certain rows of the data set by index, and it will, based on the information, it has know which uh, fragments it, it, needs, it needs to read. Uh, or, for example, head for the first rows, uh, count rows, um, to just know the number of rows. So specifically for the count rows, um, for example, for parquet, it will make use of the uh, metadata information if there is no filter. Otherwise, it will still need to materialize that column for evaluating the filter. Uh, but even for, um, so for parquet, it can give a nice speed up if you just want to know the number of, of uh, rows. Um, the different formats can have a different uh, in specialized implementation here. Also for CSV, there is an uh, improvement because uh, you only need to, uh, you don't need to parse actual values. You only need to uh, figure out where the uh, line delimiters are. So you can also have an improvement for, uh, for example, there. Um, a few things uh, still related to uh, data formats. Uh, as an aside, that uh, Parquet, we now have full, uh, complete support for the any uh, combination of, of nesting, uh, nested data types. Um, Feather, or the IPC file format, now also supports some uh, basic compression. And also probably useful for uh, Dask is that the ORC uh, um, implementation in Arrow now also supports uh, uh, writing files and not only reading. Um, I still want, want to uh, just mention it, not relevant at all for Dask, uh, but um, so whatever is available in Python is also available in the other bindings to uh, Arrow. So this is actually an example of something very similar as you could do with Dask, uh, at least for the, if, let's say, a single worker uh, version of, of Dask, where you can open a, a larger than memory file using the dplyr interface in R, um, doing the filtering, selecting uh, in parallel uh, on um, and, and out of memory. And it's actually the collect here. That's a bit similar, you could say, as the compute in Dusk. There it actually materializes, and and uh, and the rest is then done in, in pure uh, R. Um, so uh, to conclude, we already had very nice um, collaborations with uh, the people from Dusk for the implementation in, in Dusk, especially with uh, uh, Rick has done a lot on that and, and we were able to improve a lot of things in, in Arrow uh, based on that feedback. Um, there's certainly still room for further improvements. Uh, for example, the, the pre-buffering, how to integrate that with the file systems. Um, things that uh, Rick also already mentioned, the, uh, the projection and predicate pushdown, how can we uh, better integrate that. Um, the, the predicate pushdown in Arrow is actually, uh, so it uses the, for Parquet at least, it uses the information of the row group uh, statistics, but it will actually also um, not only filter on that level, but also actually filter on the row level. So uh, by pushing that down, you can also avoid, um, if you have a, a filter, filtering out, filtering out a lot of data, uh, you avoid the conversion from Arrow to uh, pandas uh, for those data. So they can also give an additional um, improvement. 
uh, there. For now, it's also only Parquet. Uh, so in principle, the, the data set interface in, in Arrow is, is generic. Uh, so that might also be an idea that, um, that we could have a, a Dask um, reader for a generic uh, data set. Uh, and then in principle, any other format that we support or any other uh, external package that uses the uh, data sets uh, functionality of Arrow and, and exposes a, a, a way to create a, an Arrow data set uh, could easily be plugged into a task. But I'm already uh, speaking too long, so uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Yaris. Uh, we have a maybe 15 minute discussion period now. Um, I can comment on a couple of things you th specifically touch on me, and that's uh, Buffering on read ahead in FSPEC is configurable. So um, there are lots of levers that you can pull there and there are options that mean that the buffering that Arrow is doing and buffering happening in FSPEC can be made to be as good as possible. Uh, in fact, it might be interesting to port the buffering that you have to FSPEC maybe. And also I'll comment just briefly that uh, I'm not talking about Fast Parquet in this session. I gave a lightning talk on it yesterday for news about that. Anybody interested where well, you can ask if you want to or just see yesterday's lightning talk. So um, everybody has the ability to unmute themselves. Please try and talk just one at a time or use the chat for questions and uh, let the discussion start. Do not be shy. <laughs> hey guys, um, this is Casey. I'm going to break in mainly so that I can just get a conversation started. Um, I'm a pretty heavy user of both of you guys' stuff, so I'm really happy to see it and jump down into it. Um, the parts you were saying at the end, yours about um, pushing down the <clears throat> the filters so that things don't need to be brought into pandas. I guess there was two parts of this conversation that were sort of elephants in the room. One was talk about about pandas and the other one was talking about fast parquet. Um, so of the if everything right now is sort of being done by having tiny bits of pandas inside of, of the of the um, of DAS data frame stuff, um, the the work that you're doing to push the filters down, does that already happen in pandas? Is it basically going there first and then DAS will just sort of get that for free? Uh, you can answer that, Aris, or I can give an overview or <laughs> any, any of us. Go ahead, uh, yeah. Martin. Yeah. Well, well, the short answer is that the aim is to have the back end do the filtering before it gets to pandas, rather than having, at the moment, that what you say is essentially what happens with the legacy interface and fast parquet interface. If you want to filter, Dask will A, look at column statistics and hopefully decide some partitions don't need to be read at all. And that's done by Dask. And B, it, it will load the data and filter it in memory. That's, that's the sort of the, the legacy pattern, if you like. And the, the aim and the hope and something that already works with um, at least some filters in uh, Arrow, you'll have to tell me what works and what doesn't, uh, either of the other two, um, is that you do that before um, before you materialize a pandas data frame. So you should be able to skip a, at least some of the processing. Yeah, that's right. Just to, to clarify, DAS, for the DAS, for the um, Pyro dataset API, it's just using this, this uh, fragment generation, fragment discovery mechanism in Pyro to figure out what are all the new partitions going to be. When it does that, it passes in a filter, which you know Pyro will just ignore anything that doesn't match the filter. So you get all these fragments, then you read in park, you read in um, arrow tables. And when you read in the arrow table, you also pass in the, the filter again. And so it can do the row wise filtering. And then after that, you are actually within a part to, within like the final stage in Dask, you convert that filtered arrow table into a pandas data frame. And so it's that last step where you get the pandas data frame. Everything else is in arrow. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just read them out. Uh, given that Arrow has nascent analysis features, what do you think will be the long-term relationship with pandas? I sometimes use Arrow to speed up pandas operations like reading CSVs, but I wonder if long-term pandas will 
even be required for many types of analysis. Um, yeah, I think that that's an open question uh, or um, a good question with no clear answer at the moment. Um, so for now, the situation is that Pandas uses Arrow for um, yeah, some specific things uh, like um, just the, the IO, like uh, Parquet IO. Uh, we are starting to use it for specifically for string data in Pandas. Um, it will be an option in the next release uh, because, yeah, for, for numeric data, the difference is, is smaller, but for string data, uh, Arrow is much more efficient than how we currently use an object type array of, of Python objects. Um, so we, that's a small part where, we, there, where Pandas starts to use um, Arrow for actual analysis and DOS could of course also benefit from that. Um, and I assume that over time we will more and more integrate that or at least optionally in the beginning. Um, at some point it probably would make sense to have just um, Pandas uh, a wrapper around an, an arrow table and, and but that's, uh, yeah. We didn't really yet discuss uh, those ways forward with the, within the Pandas community much. Uh, yeah, so certainly questions that are, will be coming up more in the future. Thank you. Uh, next question for Pyro, Yaris indicated ODBC is supported. I think you said it will be supported, am I right? Um, but in any case, I am aware of Turbo Turbo DBC leveraging Pyro and NumPy. With regards to Dask, the backend to read from SQL source leverages directly Pyro. In case my source is in a relationship DB like MS uh, SQL, uh, that that's a question. Interest to know what could be the best practice to consume data bigger than memory from database. Um, the the read SQL does not. Uh, it, it uses SQL Alchemy and SQL Alchemy's drivers do whatever it is that they do. So there, there's a lot of open field there. And I believe Turbo DBC is one of those drivers, or the standard ODBC is a slower version of the same driver. So you might have some arrow features somewhere in the back end, but they're not visible to Dask in the current framework. Having said that, it would be totally reasonable for Dask to have specific SQL loaders that are tied to Arrow or, or to something else. And you could probably do that indeed via the uh, datasets API uh, eventually, but I, I don't think there's even any prototype of that at the moment. Yeah, indeed. In currently there is no support for, um, I mean, it's the idea that it's possible, but yeah, also at the, the team at Ursa Computing, we don't have much I know we don't have a, a direct um, reason to, to work on that ourselves at the moment. For Turbo DBC, um, I think, yeah, as Martin already said, you probably need uh, some custom um, layer to interact with Dask at the moment. Uh, as long as you're using SQL Alchemy as, as the Pandas is doing and, and, and Dask as well, I think, um, you go through, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, SQL Alchemy as a as a, as the um, like fetching records as as on a row basis, while the the main benefit of Turbo ODBC comes from that you can fetch columns as uh, as arrays. Um, the, the funny thing about all of that is that there's a really good chance that the data itself is stored in Parquet <laughs> on the on the remote side. So um, you certainly could do this with Hive. You could figure out where those files are and just load them rather than going through a database layer. Um, for Microsoft, I, I have no idea, but it's probably possible to do that kind of thing. But then of course you lose the SQL query engine part of it, or at least as, as things stand. I think there is something like this for Snowflake which it was just coming out for, um, actually is Arrow is used as the transport mechanism for the data to be able to efficiently get it into Dask. Uh, next question, Parquet datasets also work well with PrestoDB and um, Amazon Athena. 
but there seems to be small inconsistencies in terms of metadata bucketing, et cetera. Are there any techniques for creating Parquet data sets that work with both Pyro, Dask, and Presto Athena? It seems like an issue um, to, for compatibility with Spark, where they, I think this idea of Spark flavored Parquet data set, sorry, I don't think I quite read that correctly. Um, who wants to talk about Spark and other Parquet engines? No one. I, I can. I'll go on. Right yeah, I don't have. I don't. I don't have much background on this. I think you'd better be better suited, Martin. So um, I'll throw something out here. I've noticed we we work with data sets that came out of different systems, and we often had issues where data Parquet data sets that came out of some kind of Spark system or were ex exported from Redshift. There was something different about the metadata or the way or some extra files they wrote that it made it difficult to read with Dask or something we wrote out with Dask couldn't be read in on the other side. So so the especially Parquet data sets, which are multi-file, like you know, um, like some place sometimes you could read them in as a list of files, sometimes you couldn't, sometimes yeah, you know, so those uh, you could read in a folder, sometimes you couldn't. So there seems to be not good compatibility between stuff created by Dask and being read in by Spark and vice versa. I, I can comment a little on why this is the case. Uh, the Parquet specification has been around for, for many years and it defines what happens yeah, within a file and it has undergone a, a number of improvements over the years and from the time that something is improved in the spec to when it actually appears in one of the engines, there, there can be a significant lag. So something like uh, Arrow Fastback that is not in the Java landscape, there isn't a need to support it until we notice that it's being supported by other engines like Spark. Uh, and when that happens, then you have to struggle to, to catch up to support whatever encoding it might be. That's actually the smaller part of the problem. The bigger part is that there are conventions on top of the spec. For example, the hive partitioning of many directories is not in that spec. It's something that probably MapReduce came up with this or, or Hive itself, I'm not sure. And since it's not in the spec, the implementations of it are not necessarily, well, that, that is one of the better ones. But um, for example, Fastback A, when I, when I did this partitioning thing, people complained, hey, I'm using drill, which is something that I've never used. And it partitions files in a different way. Can you support it? Yes, after a large amount of struggling, Fastback A can read that layout. In practice, I don't think anybody uses it, like except for the few people that originally complained. So there's not a... Is not a very good cost benefit from our point of view to support all of the different flavors. Really? Having said that, when you get something and it doesn't work, of course, let us know and, and we'll do our best to figure out why it's different. Yeah, another example um, where it really is Dask's fault, there was a period there after like the overhaul of the, like, the pluggable engine where writing out the global metadata file was wrong, like the file paths were not included correctly. And so you might, if, if there was another, you know, system that was using the global metadata file, it might have been, you know, complaining, right? So there are cases where there just is a problem in Dask. Yeah, just I, I was, I was one of the person who asked the question, and just for context, for me, I actually don't, I don't think it's really Dask or or Pyro's problem in some ways. I've, what I've found is that I think Athena is built off of Presto, so that's why I mentioned Athena. But I've found it's a very efficient method for if you have like a giant if you have a large set of csv files and you want to get them into a parquet um i found athena to be much faster and scalable at doing that than when i try to do it with in dask but ultimately then you want to kind of do your actual analysis in dask or you know or dask or or pandas and there's this slight kind of incompatibility where you end up kind of having to reconvert the the, the secondary be data set I, I know that Spark has a sort of legacy compatibility options. I, I don't know about Presto Athena. Perhaps there are things you can do at that end. Yeah, and I, I think in some ways it's just Amazon, you know, Amazon's doing its own thing. They don't really care about, you know, how other people are structuring it that I think, uh, you know, Athena is taking advantage of. So I was just curious if, if other people would run into kind of fixes for it. Yeah. But thank you. Appreciate it. 
uh, the next question, and perhaps we'll make this the last one before moving on to the next section. As a reminder, there will be time at the very end of the workshop for general discussion on any of the topics that we cover here. So the last question is, what level of support for predicate pushdown on nested structures is available or planned? Uh, uh, this is in the context of Arrow. Um, I, I guess I can, I can, I can say Fastback it does not have plans for this. So that's a quick answer. Yeah, I can also say Dask is probably not planning much on this either. So um, this is all for yours. Yeah, I'm not fully sure. Um, so the there are two aspects. Um, one aspect is I, you need to um, be able to um, specify your filter expression. Uh, so uh, there is certainly plans for support that you can, for example, if you have a, a struct uh, nested type that you can select a subfield, that's actually already possible, but it needs to be uh, on the C++ side that it needs to be exposed in Python. Um, so that's one aspect, but then, um, so if you then select a normal uh, primitive array column and you can uh, do any kind of filter operation on that. Um, but if it's about, for example, about the list array with, with uh, nested lists, um, the, um, yeah, the actual operation that you want to do also needs to be uh, implemented. Uh, hey, so um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. So um, if we are doing that one ending on the 18, at Darhas. Darhas yeah, maybe, thank, uh, thank you. Yeah. Another question for us. Um, I, I, I guess actually the, the simple part of this, the partition level filtering or, or the uh, row group level filtering, that that will already work now. That's that's not quite pushed down, but it is part of the picture. Yeah. Well, in the sense that partition statistics are used to exclude. Right, right. If you say that my I, I only want to consider values in my nested list map type or whatever it is, only consider values greater than some threshold, then you will be able to efficiently throw out those row groups that don't have any values that match it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, exactly how you would phrase this at the desk, and I'm not sure, but I think, I think it might just work as is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, you know, for struct nesting, it's pretty clear that that's not too much of a of a, of a challenge to to implement, right? But but the, the nested list, of course, then you need to define a you know, language in your predicate pushdown language or a component yeah, in your I, predicate pushdown yeah. language to broadcast um, those kinds yeah. of. Um, awkward array might have plans or might even be able to do this, it would be worth checking. So awkward well, array. I, I work on awkward. That's why I'm asking. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not fully sure related to, uh, for example, the row group uh, statistics and filtering. Um, I'm not fully sure if at least the uh, implementation in PyArrow, um, if you support statistics for uh, nested columns. Um, oh, the, the, the statistics are certainly available in the Parquet metadata. They should, I mean, there is space for them, whether they're populated is a different matter. Yeah, so that, that I'm not fully sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's move on. That was the tabular section. The next section is about um, array-oriented data. So the first speaker will be Isaiah Norton, and you can uh, take the screen and, and uh, start when you're ready. Again, we'll have two talks followed by a, a discussion period. Okay, um, everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Isaiah Norton and I'm a software engineer at uh, TileDB Inc, which is uh, the company behind uh, the TileDB format and engine. Um, some links, uh, homepage, GitHub, um, Twitter uh, at the bottom. Um, I'll be giving a brief background of TileDB um, and then talk a little bit about TileDB's desk integrations. Um, which are uh, nascent and hopefully um, expanding uh, this year. Um, so TileDB is a uh, chunked columnar storage format uh, with support for both dense and sparse arrays um, and dimensionally. 
um, in a single library and a relatively uh, unified API. Um, it's an open specification, um, currently uh, single implementation, um, but the core library and all the integrations are, are open source, um, MIT license. Um, and briefly, just for people who aren't familiar, um, there's a company behind this uh, spun out of uh, MIT and Intel Labs and the Broad Institute in 2017, um, and we have a SaaS product um, uh, built around the, the core, um, which has data management and serverless compute. Um, and uh, we initially, um, as a company, had a very strong focus on uh, geospatial and genomics use cases, um, but we're, you know, building building on those uh, experiences. Um, but again, everything I'm talking about today is open source, MIT licensed. Um, so TileDB combines uh, a format with an IO and, and a query uh, engine capability. Um, all capability is built into the core C++ library, which means that um, all of the uh, higher level APIs benefit from, from all improvements. Um, and it's really designed for embedding uh, with a stable C API. Um, uh, IO and compute operations are, are fully parallelized um, internally. So we have our own internal thread pools and, and uh, task um, operations, um, which Sometimes, uh, you know, has has uh, had issues um, when working with Dask. We have to control uh, the number of threads, as many people here are probably familiar with. You don't want to oversaturate um, your your system, um, spitting up uh, many many processes with too many threads. Um, key features of TileDB um, again support for both uh, dense and sparse n-dimensional arrays, um, and the sparse arrays are are potentially heterogeneous. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, support for data versioning and time traveling, and uh, support for compression, encryption, and uh, consolidation which is a, uh, a metadata step similar to, uh, to some of the things that were talked about for um, Parquet, which uh, can, can improve reads. Uh, we also support um, partial reads uh, of chunks from, uh, from the tile structure. And the, the library has uh, built-in support for S3, GCS, uh, Azure, um, as well as uh, HDFS. Um, so all of, the, uh, all of the libraries can, can read from those sources. Um, briefly, you know, we're available on PIP and Anaconda, um, import TileDB, and you can read from an S3 array, which uh, is, is nice. Um, so TileDB data types, uh, dense arrays are n-dimensional, um, storing any scalar primitives, um, strings uh, as, as values, as well as um, homogeneous multi-cell values. So we read those, uh, read those back as NumPy record arrays. Um, uh, we also support sparse arrays, which is uh, kind of the, the big differentiator. Um, those can be any number of dimensions and potentially mixed dimensions. So you can have dimensions um, which are essentially uh, similar to uh, indexes in a data frame. And we actually use dimensions to, to model data frames when we store data frames. So we're, we're a little bit in between uh, the array world and the data frame world. Um, and critically, you can slice on any dimension type. Um, so as I'll touch on a bit later, we do support data frames as well. Um, and we model data frames by mapping uh, indexes into the, to TileDB dimensions. Um, briefly, the data versioning and time traveling features, every write, um, this is built into the core library. Every write is time stamped and has a UUID. And so you can do, uh, you can do incremental writes and you can take views on arrays at a specific time point or a time point range um, for, for time traveling. Um, which is uh, again, it's bu it's built into the core library. There's no uh, there's no higher level um, system that is as needed to get this functionality, um, and and we think that that's you know there's a lot of use cases where that's that's valuable and it's it's been useful for for our customers so far. Uh, of course, by default, we open the the most recent uh, view. Um, we have a very strong focus on uh, APIs and integrations. So um, as I mentioned, the core library is implemented in C++ and exposes a C API. Then we have a separate C++ API that is built on top of that um, in order to, to maintain stability and avoid exposing any of the internals of the library. Um, we also, on top of that, we build Python, R, Go, Java, um, and Spark um, APIs. Um, and we have expanded uh, recently and, and been able to hire several people. So we have a couple of others um, in active development um, we also have a strong integration with uh, several SQL engines. Um, so we have uh, plugins built uh, directly for, for various engines, um, including uh, MariaDB. So we have a, a storage engine backend for MariaDB called MyTile, um, which lets you run SQL queries against any tile of array at any uh, supported URI and get back the results. Um, we also support both uh, PrestoDB and the, the recent Trino fork. Um, we're 
currently maintaining both uh, both of those uh, backends and, and plan to for the foreseeable future. Um, and via Spark, we support Spark SQL as well. Um, as I mentioned, the company's initial focus has really been on geospatial and genomics verticals. Um, so we uh, ship talented support in GDAL and PDAL, which for folks um, who are unfamiliar are, are uh, data abstraction libraries for, uh, for geospatial data and for point data. So um, the, the GDAL library um, supports many input formats and then can write out into a, into a TileDB data structure. Um, uh, PDAL supports, for example, LIDAR data, um, point cloud data, and that can be translated into a TileDB data structure and stored at, at any target um, with those integrations. Um, and recently we've been, we've been building um, some integration with, with X-Ray as well, which I know many of the Dask uh, community um, people use. Um, currently it's read only, only uh, but we're building out the, the translation support to be able to um, do write as well um, in the near future. Um, and then in the genomic side, um, we have a, a library called a TileDB BCF, um, which is one of the, the initial really strong drivers of, of TileDB's development. Um, and one of our main customers um, uses that, which uh, models genomic variants as, as TileDB uh, sparse arrays. So I'll touch on that in a bit in a second. Um, and a relatively recent um, feature that we've added, which uh, may be of interest is um, we have arrow support. Um, so the core library supports um, exporting buffers um, uh, into arrow format, as well as ingesting them. And we currently use this in Python and we're, we're gonna be expanding um, use across the APIs um, because uh, arrow is, uh, has, a lot of, uh, has a lot of nice functionality. And we're very grateful um, for all the people um, who are involved in arrow um, for, for building that functionality. Um, we also use uh, arrow in uh, the, the VCF um, system, which I'll, I'll discuss a bit more in a sec. Um, so I mainly work on the Python API. Um, we support uh, NumPy indexing on any tile of the array. Um, we integrate with, with pandas. Um, so we have a from pandas and a from CSV that, that uses pandas under the hood, uh, can read from a pandas data frame. Um, there are many options for, uh, for how to write chunks and tiles and uh, compression and all of that can, can be specified as keyword arguments, but we try to do as much as we can automatically and figure out what dimensions to create based on the indexes that a specific data frame uh, presents. Um, and then similarly with, with uh, from CSV, um, you know, that's, that's functionality that I've, that I've worked on. And, and um, currently it's, it's kind of custom, um, <clears throat> but we're, we, we use arrow on the read side. Um, we're planning to use arrow more on the right side um, to simplify, uh, to simplify things a little bit and, and cut down the, the overhead from pandas um, until the, you know, the final uh, presentation. So we can uh, also query um, tile to be arrays uh, ranges and return. So if A is a tile to be array object, we can, uh, we have an indexer that can query a start and range and return a tile to be, um, uh, sorry, a pandas data frame. Um, there are, there's some uh, attribute selection, dimension selection, and uh, we're currently uh, building some push down um, on values as well, which will be uh, probably released in, in June in the next uh, tile to be release and the next tile to be Python release. And um, a new feature that, that I've worked on recently is, is uh, iteration over partial results, um, which can, can reduce um, memory usage. And currently that does, uh, that supports returning results as arrow tables. Um, in the future, we're planning to also uh, support record batches. I know there's there's some overlap there, but um, we want to support both for systems that uh, that that use record batches. So there's a couple. Um, I know I'm probably running out of time, but there's a, a two two Dask integrations that we've focused on um, so far. One is uh, Dask Array, and the other one is uh, Dask Data Frames, specifically in the genomics case. Um, so this, uh, thanks to, uh, to to upstream. Um, Dask acceptance and, and help. Um, this ships in, in Dask now. Uh, there's a from TileDB um, option that supports any TileDB URI and you can customize the, the chunking. Um, and so I have a small, you know, 100 element array. Read that in and you get back a Dask array that you can do um, any, uh, any computations on. Um, the, on the VCF side, we have, uh, this was developed sort of earlier. Um, so there's a, a custom interface that uses Arrow uh, to create Dask's, well, Pandas data frames, and then can export as Dask data frames um, for query results from the, from 
the variant call format. And this VCF product um, supports gen genomic variants. Um, the, the VCF uh, is a very common um, data format for, for genomics, and it's, it's sort of our uh, driving genomics use case, um, both for ingestion and re-export um, to validate, uh, to validate the, the storage. Um, and the largest user right now of this library is uh, uses Spark, but they're transitioning to Dask. So we've, we've added support for both. Um, the data model there um, really has driven the development of the heterogeneous dimension support. So uh, the data model of VCF um, is uh, two string dimensions for the sample ID and the contig. And then uh, for, for folks who are familiar, this is, this is genomic position and, and sample ID. And uh, our users want to query on, on all of these, but in particular, the, the, the position and the contig. Uh, so this this has been pretty uh, well tested in, in production now um, with you know terabyte scale um, uh, arrays of, of genomic data. Um, a few things uh, in progress um, for hopefully in the next uh, month to two months. Um, generalized DAS data frame support. So we want to be able to read any tile to array um, as as a DAS data frame. We've had a lot of requests for that. Um, improving the the integration of X-ray. Um, uh, it, it, with X-ray and, and Dask um, and reading uh, and doing computations on tile to be backed X-arrays with Dask. Um, as I mentioned, error record batch support. Um, and then we have a new feature, which is uh, push down um, filtering on read, which is coming up uh, soon in, in, in early June. And I'll stop there, um, but I'm happy to take questions uh, later offline. Um, at hello at tiledb um, for anyone who's interested. Um, tiledb.com and at tiledb on Twitter. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. And uh, we will have a question period after the next talk, yeah. which will be Davis on Czar. Uh, I should mention I will not be moderating the question period myself since I also work on Czar. And um, that, that's also true for the final section. Okay, am I am I audible and visible? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Dask and Czar. Um, so who am I? I'm someone who works at Genelia Research Campus in Northern Virginia, and I use Dask to manage really, really big imaging data sets. And before that, I used Dask to manage really, really big imaging data sets in a different group. Um, I'm not a core Czar developer. Uh, I'm not a a czar genius or a czar expert, but I have had lunch a lot of times with John Kierkum, who's one of the core czar developers. And I know enough about czar to get myself in trouble and to give this presentation. So in this talk, I'm gonna describe what problem czar solves. I'll give examples of how to use czar with Dask um, and throw in some, um, some tips, some usage tips. And then I'll go into caveats and this can maybe blend into a discussion about the future of czar. So the problem that Czar solves is that of storing n-dimensional arrays. So suppose we have a data set like this, 512 gigs, 4096 chunks. The entire array probably doesn't fit in memory. Um, how do you save that to disk? So the first option is just to gather everything on one machine and then save it into a single file. So the cost of this, beyond the fact that your machine may not have enough memory, is that your IO is going to be serial. So you're going to be writing to disk serially, and then you're going to be reading to disk probably serially, or reading from disk. It's possible that you can memory map and have different workers read different regions of the same file, but practically you should assume that all of your I.O. with a single file is going to be uh, serial. Um, the upside is it is simple. You have one file. That's very nice. Um, but uh, the desire to have parallel I.O and to divide the data up into chunks leads to a different approach. Um, and that would be, you have all your workers save data to the same file, but in separate little chunks. And so this can give you nearly parallel writes if you're using multi-threading. Um, and you might be able to get parallel reads too, because once the file is finished, each worker who wants to read can uh, be told which offset they need to seek into to read chunks. Um, this will break down if you try and do object storage on the cloud, um, unless you do something fancy. And then uh, chunk compression, the desire to compress each chunk individually, which is essentially a function of the data inside that chunk, uh, 
that induces dependencies between your write tasks. So you really sacrifice some of the potential parallel throughput for writing. Because ultimately, if you want to write a bunch of compressed chunks to one file, there needs to be some, uh, some management of the final size of that file and the offset of each chunk. And this puts a limit on the parallel throughput you can expect to have. But this is the strategy HDF5 uses, and it's a perfectly valid storage strategy. And you also end up with one file, which is nice. It's simple. Uh, the czar approach is just that each worker saves a chunk to a separate file. And so you get parallel reads, and parallel writes to the limit of what your file system can support. Uh, and the cost is that you have elaborate storage. You have a lot of files. You have one file per chunk. Um, and it's basically that simple. So uh, as I described, czar is just a storage scheme for compressed, chunked, and dimensional arrays. Uh, czar is hierarchical which means that czar has the concept of essentially two nouns. There are arrays, which I just described. Those are uh, things with a size, a data type, a uh, chunk size, and a compression type. And then there are groups, which are folders, essentially. They're things that can contain arrays, or they can contain other groups. Uh, czar is scalable. And so far as, as long as you have space on your storage system for more chunks, you can make your array arbitrarily large. It's cloud friendly because the output, the, the Azar array is just a collection of separate files. Those will be separate objects on cloud storage. So it's very easy to access them independently. Um, and thanks to the magic of FS spec, uh, many use cases of uh, reading Azar arrays in the cloud just work. Uh, and Zar is extensible. Almost every aspect of it is pluggable or customizable. And Zar itself is more of a sort of a specification of an IO scheme and less of a description of how chunks are actually stored. And that's actually one of the weaknesses that I'll talk about later, or one of the pain points. So in, in uh, layman's terms, Zar basically takes big arrays and puts them in small compressed files. And there's the documentation. So what does the API look like? Uh, Zar arrays essentially look like NumPy or Dask arrays with a few extra uh, keyword arguments in the function signature. So here I create some data, uh, 0 through 15. Um, and I'm going to create a czar array. And so the first thing I say is, uh, what type of chunk storage thing do I want? And I'm just giving it a string, which means czar is going to use its default. And this essentially creates a group. And then I say, the path should be foo. That's actually the path to my array within the group. Then there's the shape. That's the shape of my data, dtype, data's dtype. This is the chunks. This is the very important decision you have to make. How do you want your data to be chunked on disk? And then the mode. And here I'm using W because I'm actually touching the file system. I have to tell Zar what kind of access do I want to the file system. And then this returns a, an array-like object. And we can do a get item. Um, and you see this full of zeros, even though I didn't write anything. That's because the default behavior of Zar is to fill an array with something. Uh, in this case, the default is 0. And so if you read from the array, you're going to get back whatever that fill value is until you start writing stuff into the array. So what does this look like on the file system? Well, Zar has created group and array metadata. So we have the .z group metadata. That's the metadata for the root. And then there's the .z array metadata. That's the metadata for the array. And there's no data. Nothing has been written to disk. OK? So we can now read and write data using NumPy syntax. So now I'm assigning every element of my Zar array uh, to the elements associated with my data, which is a NumPy array. And then I query the czar array, and I get back the data I expect. And then we see that after doing that, values have now been written to disk. Um, so with this storage scheme, someone may be suspicious that we're putting all the chunks in one folder. That will come up later. But each of these chunks is basically a compressed piece of my original array data. Um, in addition to storing array data, you can also store arbitrary JSON serializable metadata. And groups and arrays have metadata. And the metadata is just stored in a file. So uh, in the czar Python API, you just assign values um, to the adders property, which looks like a dict. Um, and you can read it back out. And then you can see when I assigned this uh, incredibly uh, useful piece of metadata to the adders property, we've updated uh, the .z adders file. And it's JSON formatted. So. Dask and Zar interoperation. So uh, Dask offers a variety of methods for storing uh, our Dask arrays in Zar format. So here I'm going to make a Dask array. Um, it's 1D, has a chunk size 4. It's slightly different values than before, but it's basically a linear range. 
Um, so there's the Dask array to czar method, which is just on Dask arrays. Um, and what this does is basically it will create everything. It will create the group. It will create the array. Um, and you it will complain if you if there's no array already there. Um, and by default, it just computes stuff. So here I'm returning essentially the uh, de the delayed operation, and then I compute it. Um, then there's dask.array.store, which is a little bit more generic. Uh, store takes uh, as its first argument something that Dask can call set item on. So it could be an HDF5 file. It could be a memory mapped NumPy array. Dask doesn't really need to know that this is a czar array. And then Dask will give each worker essentially a task where it says, here's some data. Here's a thing you can put data in, put the data in that thing. Um, and so this requires that you have already created your czar hierarchy. You've already initialized storage. Um, you've already managed the metadata, all that stuff. Uh, uh, and both of these operations, so to czar actually uses store. And both of them, I believe, use uh, DAS delayed, which means that uh, what you get back is essentially just a single thing that's a little bit hard to introspect. And then, as anyone who's uh, tried to go hard has experienced, sometimes you have to go to map blocks. And this is essentially the map block solution that I actually end up using a lot. And I've been meaning to submit a PR to the court desk to talk about this. Um, because instead of returning a single delayed object, this essentially returns an array or a list of arrays where each element of the array corresponds to a chunk of your data. And the array gets filled with a return value depending on whether your write was successful or not. And this array can be sliced. So you can do your storage operations in slices if you like, but it's considerably more verbose. So uh, for most people, dash.array.store works fine. Um, for my arrays, which are very, very big, I have to use this. And I have to manage failures because I'm writing to S3. So what I'm not showing is wrapping this with the exponential back off and everything. Um, and then reading Dask arrays from czar, by contrast to writing, reading is super easy. You can either do from array with the previously initialized czar array, or you can just say from czar, and uh, you just give it a path. Uh, you give it a path to the storage, and then you give it what component you want to use. So caveats. Czar, uh, as a format, abstracts over the chunk storage implementation. Czar is not particularly opinionated about how you actually store your chunks. And if you look at the czar source code, you can see implementations for lots of chunk storage backends in there, which is great. There's a lot of options for storing your data. Um, the problem is it's difficult for a consumer of a czar array to infer what that chunk storage implementation is. So by, for example, these are two czar arrays that I created just with the, the czar core library. Um, they have the exact same data, but they have very different chunk layout on disk. Uh, it's 2D data, so that's why we see the keys having a dot separator here. And then in this case, why we see a nested directory structure. Um, so building on that, one of the caveats of Dask is that it allows you to make a lot of small files. Um, and it allows users who they just pick a chunk size that seems right to them, and then they essentially start running their save operation. They can easily fill up, they can put thousands and thousands of files in a single directory. So when you start to get above 10,000 files in one directory on a POSIX file system, LS and all sorts of other useful tools start to fail. Um, when you have tons of small files, you can't drag and drop anymore. You'll start to need Dask for doing really basic things like deleting, deleting a czar array. Um, you will get angry emails from IT. Uh, I get constantly flamed. Uh, unfairly, I believe, but constantly flamed by the IT people where I work because they see the amount of files that people like me are generating. And it bugs them because there's overhead associated with accessing each file on basically any storage system. So some user discretion uh, is advised when creating czar arrays. Um, and I'll point out, this is the default chunk storage scheme for czar, which is to put all the chunks in one folder. Um, this, which is nested, and puts the chunks in separate folders is almost always better, but it's not the default. You have to go in there and say, I want to use the nested directory store. I don't want to use the vanilla directory store. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's something that can trip people up. And then lastly, the concept of one chunk per file may not be future proof. So in my work, I have data that's chunked 64 cubed, and I have hundreds of thousands of chunks. And I need that chunking because of the consuming application. Um, but I don't necessarily need that many files. If the chunks could be fused together into um, bigger files, 
and then the consuming API would know how to seek into a file and read out the chunk, that would make my life much, much easier at the cost of decreased uh, parallel write throughput and the need for something to basically compactify chunks together. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Uh, Rick or Yaris was going to do this. I can't remember which of you. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so um, we have time for um, some questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, or put it in um, put it in the uh, chat. I have a question about that um, last bit that you just said about wanting to store multiple um, chunks in the same uh, file. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the best way to implement that from the DAS side would be to have like a map many blocks where you um, where you could do a, an operation that, that then outputs to several blocks? Or would it be better to have the read <coughs> happen um, have a have a, the regular map box, but but then read into the chunk. So, I think I think this kind of operation probably needs to be up to the storage backend. Um, so it might it might requ it might just require regular map blocks, but the thing the the array target that the data is being written into would need to know like we need to basically know that stuff has to be compactified. Um, and maybe that wouldn't work because maybe you'd want a process where you write out a bunch of intermediate chunks and then you run a second task that sucks them up and compactifies them together. I don't actually know. So the, um, there is a format used in the electron microscopy community called Neuroglancer Precomputed. It's a really fantastic name that makes no sense. But uh, that format basically does this for chunks of image data. Um, and I don't know how that is scheduled. I don't think it's uh, distributed computing friendly. I think the C++ library that does this just does it all with threading. Um, so yeah, the, the, the optimal Dask approach for that type of storage, I don't know what it would be. Although I, I assume this has been, this is kind of analogous to, to HDF5s. Like if you have a czar array where each chunk or each file is actually an HDF5 filled with sub chunks, then it's essentially the same problem. That's exactly what I was going to actually ask about is because, you know, when working on HDF5 earlier, I was involved a lot of conversations of like, hey, it's really nice to have one file where everything, you know, you can do partial IO for a specific chunk, right? But then there are advantages to having many files. And there was actually, you actually found that like scalability is somewhere in the middle, right? That you yeah. actually wanted. And so that's what exactly I was going to ask. Is there a plan to have like partial IO within one of those few uh, files, right? I guess you're saying it would be analogous to having like a, a collection of HDF5 files, right? I, th I think it's the same problem. Um, so the czar core library does support partial IO. Um, okay. If, if the, although it might be within a chunk, I don't, and I think it supports, if you use a reference file system from FS spec, then you can essentially say, you know, czar is like, okay, I've got to get this thing, but the czar doesn't know that that thing actually exists inside a separate file. Um, I haven't played with that, but I think that that looks extremely promising. Um, there, so, there was a, a lightning talk yesterday about this for those that are interested. Uh, the reference fi um, file system that is. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely promising. Um, the one problem is if you do anything fancy, like because there's so many different storage backends, if I come up with a really awesome storage backend for my data, I will also need to distribute all the code for reading it because there are czar implementations in a bunch of different languages, and there's zero guarantee that they know anything except the standard single directory store. And they can say, oh yeah, we, we, we support czar, but really they support that specific chunk storage implementation. So the, um, that's not the only thing that keeps me from you know, scaling out something with the reference file system, but that is a big worry. I have to work with people who consume czar arrays in Java, um, and so I can't do anything too fancy. Or I could do something too fancy and then just say, too bad, guys. But um, I, I'll, I'll go with the first option. There are a few uh, questions in the chat. In the meantime, I will start with the last one. Um, okay. So 
the question is, is there ever a situation when you want uh, different Dask chunks uh, than Zar chunks? Yes, almost uh, always. Sure leading, uh, yeah, you, you basically always want bigger Dask chunks than Zar chunks, in my experience. Um, and uh, the reason for that, at least in my experience, is because often I'm writing arrays that are designed to be consumed um, by something that's really working chunk by chunk, like a data visualization, where someone is moving around a 3D visualization and they're super local. So they're in a, uh, they're in a, a subregion of some enormous volume and the consuming application isn't doing anything over all the chunks. It's only saying, okay, where, where are we now? What chunks do we need? And then you want to minimize the time required to load a single chunk. Um, and so in that context, small chunks are really good. It leads to a nice user experience. But if I had a Dask array where the Dask array chunks mapped one-to-one -one onto those Zar chunks, uh, I'd, I'd be waiting weeks for the scheduler to figure everything out because it'd be literally millions of chunks. So my experience has been when you're writing or reading, you almost always want to pick a Dask chunk size that is uh, on the order of multiple tens of megabytes, um, whereas your output chunk size might be like one megabyte. Thanks. It also Thanks. may be that the backend can fetch the separate chunks concurrently if it's S3 or Google or uh, Azure. So each task task gets multiple chunks, but you don't pay for the latency multiple times. Yeah. Thanks. There were no questions for TileDB. I think there might have been further up. Yeah, there was. One uh, question now for, for TileDB. So we talked a lot about um, the chunking and uh, file strategy uh, for ZAR. So the question is, how, how does that work for TileDB? Um, and are there any differences for local file system or object uh, storage? Um, uh, is is Isaiah sure. still here? Yeah, yeah okay. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, yeah, there, uh, just to note, there's, there's also a, a question uh, about ZAR at 1122, so make sure to get back to that. Um, but for, for TileDB, um, the, uh, the initial um, design was actually uh, pretty similar to ZAR um, with, with one chunk per file um, and ran into um, the same issues with uh, the sysadmins being very mad about running out of inodes. Um, so the, the tiling um, in TileDB's name actually uh, comes from uh, storing multiple chunks um, in what, in what we call a tile. And then we can read, uh, do partial range reads um, on object stores or on local file systems um, in order to get uh, just the data. So um, for, for dense arrays, um, uh, the, the, the tiling um, is pretty straight, pretty straightforward. Um, it's on a per dimension basis. Um, for sparse arrays, um, the, uh, we can store um, uh, Multiple uh, multiple chunks um, of of a sparse um, range um, in a single tile, um, and then we have uh, we have a metadata footer that um, describes um, the uh, range of data, an MBR for uh, the data that's stored in, in a specific fragment, um, so that we can do uh, we can only read the fragments uh, that we need from the object store from the the uh, local file system. Thanks. Um, there was an, an older question in the chat about um, how does it compare to, um, so, um, and then I think specifically Zar, how does it compare with Parquet? Are there advantages, disadvantages, the, you know, use cases? Um, so the, I think it, the main difference is the columnar versus array uh, storage, but maybe uh, Davis, if you can um, comment on that or. So yeah, I've never used um, I've never used uh, Parquet, so I can't speak to the details. But I think uh, one my impression is that essentially there's a privileged index. There's a concept of iterating over columns, and then iterating within a column is a very different operation. Um, and with ZAR arrays, uh, iterating over any of the array axes, it's all the same. Um, but you can't, you're limited in what kinds of elements you have in the container. Like the base elements should be 
um, things with a straightforward type, like you think of it as being like a NumPy array. You can put structured data in there, but I, I rarely see it. And it's going to have trouble if your chunks have uh, a different rank. Um, it really wants it to be like a box or a cube or a hypercube filled with things that are all pretty much the same size uh, in memory. They might not compress to different sizes, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe to elaborate a bit further. So um, indeed, I think um, a big difference is um, Parquet is really tailored to tabular data. So you, you can, in principle, store a multidimensional array using some nested uh, type, but that's um, uh, much less the, the use case. Um, in in um, data or like the file format, I think a big difference is that um, while, uh, while Zar will write every chunk in in a different file in park or in Parquet, indeed the like the um, your row groups and column chunks and pages within a row group they are contained in in a in a single file. Uh, of course, if you have a big data set, you will uh, still partition in multiple files. Um, but then within each file, you have um, different columns, column uh, groups, and it's right together. Um, Can we, can we was, have the last one be, are these formats going to replace yeah. uh, HDF, um, I think it should say, rather than that CDF here? Uh, I, um, I, I don't yeah, know much about NetCDF. Um, for my personal use, these, these formats have replaced HDF5. Um, but I can see many scenarios where the complexity of a lot of files <laughs> in the file system is undesirable. Um, and if the if you don't care too much about being able to really write in parallel, then I think HDF5 and that concept still has a place. Um, but uh, as an empirical question, I don't actually know. Um, so maybe also I want to um, encourage the presenters, you can still um, answer. Uh, there are a few questions uh, remaining in the chat. Um, but now we can uh, move to the last talk um, of Martin. Could I still, I, I wanted um, Isaiah's opinion on that question, on whether it's possible to supplant HDF on, on some reasonable time scale, or, or yeah. is that is that not something that you even aspire to? <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, we, we, we're interested in addressing um, a lot of the use cases um, of, of HTF and uh, NetCDF um, and uh, targeting especially um, very good support for cloud object stores, um, which I think has been limited so far um, in, an, in an open source um, way. Um, and you know we're we're really um, driven by uh, by customer needs and and requests. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'll leave it at that. Um. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll go then. Uh, uh, and again. Um, Rick, I guess, will be the one to take questions. There were going to be two talks in this section. There's now uh, only one, unfortunately. So uh, we'll have. Uh, well, I guess it will be 20 minutes in the end once I'm done. Okay, let's talk about intake and specifically intake in the Dask flavor because that's where we are. Uh, if you are if you want to know more about the intake ecosystem and, and the different drivers that obviously we have documentation, please feel free. Um, my argument is that intake is the cataloging solution for big data, Dask data, and, and with a particular emphasis on Dask. There are other things that do cataloging or catalog-like things. Uh, intake was specifically designed to be this layer and specifically to give you access to all of the IO functionality within Dask. So um, what am I talking about what is a catalog. Actually, it's amazing. A lot of people manage to do an incredible amount of science, data science, other analysis on data without cataloging any of their data sources. But you do need to get data. And a big part of your job can be finding the right data set that's going to answer your question. This is particularly true in some large institutional corporate situation. You have a data lake, you need the right 
database view or whatever it may be, you need to get the right data. You need to make sure it's the latest data. You need to make sure that it's the right uh, format. How do you load that format? There's loads of questions around this and Intake aims to be the tool that can solve all of those things with a little bit of work on, on the part of a data curator. So I, I'm going to not go into too much details on this. Um, again, I want to concentrate on Dask. But interesting that there are um, different kinds of data out there. Um, some data files will tell you what they are. They might have descriptions. They will tell you their data types internally. They may have all kinds of metadata. They might have internal chunking and describe that chunking. But actually, a lot of the time, we're faced with other things like CSV, which is still ubiquitous, in which case, maybe you know a little bit about it because you can look at the header of the file, but you have to infer chunks. You have to infer types. That chunking might break. Uh, if there's any metadata about it, you're going to need to put that somewhere else. A very common place to put that is actually in the file names, the file paths, which is obviously is, is not really sustainable in the long term. It's just strings and somebody needs to interpret that. So there's this whole bucket of unknowns that gets in the way of you finding what data you actually need to solve your problem. Uh, and then having found it, you actually need to load it and you want to load it with Dask. So Dask has a lot of IO functions and I've been involved with a certain number of these myself. Um, getting the invocation right for a given function, let's say read parquet, read CSV, two of the most common ones, they have a lot of options. And uh, you might need to go through several iterations of trial and error to figure out which option is actually going to be able to load your data, which is super annoying. And I do apologize as having been involved in making some of these functions that they are so complicated. Some of that is necessary. There just are so many ways to load a given file type. Uh, maybe they're more complicated than they need to be. And then um, what if your data is not on your disk because you're computing in the cloud, that you're that's a big reason to want to use Dask in the first place. Now you have to deal with credentials and remote storage and all kinds of extra options there. And um, these arguments to make things go, maybe they're in your environment, maybe they're in your config. There's a, a, another layer of complexity. So Intake uh, comes in and let's say solves this problem in quotes. It, it handles this problem to some extent. You write each of your uh, data sets as a declarative code block. Um, this, in the simplest case that I will demonstrate, is in a YAML file. It doesn't need to be in the YAML file, but that's very nice for examples because you can actually see it in human readable text, what's going on. Once you have a specification that can be in a place, and that place is that URL is the thing that you're going to reference so that you can look at all of your data uh, descriptions, you can find a thing that you want, and you don't need to know then how to load it because it's already declared, and you just call intake and intake will sort it out for you. This enables you to update those specifications in place. You could version control them, you can make catalogs that expose some set of data, some other set of data, these can be hierarchical, so a catalog can contain more catalogs, they can be different views on the same data, and you can even include these in PIP or Conda packages. So you can just install your data catalogs. You can install the data itself. The API you get is really simple. You have discover, describe, read, and to Dask. The last one, of course, is the most important here. There may be other two X methods, but uh, we, I'll skip over those for the time being. Interestingly, um, Intake covers a lot of drivers. So there is this plugin directory. It no longer fits on the screen. Each of these, uh, aside from the very top one, is a separate repo. And in that repo, there you need to, it, it handles different kinds of data. It might be a data service. It might be a data format. And uh, generally, if Dask can read it, then Intake can read it using Dask. On top of being able to find your data and uh, load your data, you get extra bonus functionality. The hierarchical catalogs I already mentioned, you get other data types, other Dask friendly data types, such as X-ray and streams with a Z for streaming data. Uh, you can set up a data server or a catalog server that will be the endpoint that you can control in 
fine-grained manner who gets to see which data entry you can stream data via the server if you want to. You can automatically def uh, define how you would like your data to be plotted. So you can include uh, visual elements in your data specification. You can um, make user parameters. Those are indications to the user which options are meant to be settable, maybe giving a max min or range of choices for them. Uh, brand new functionality, you can derive new data sets from other data sets so that you can automatically say, here's the base data set, it's a rather large version, here is data set B, there is some aggregation over that data set, and I'm going to use Dask to do that aggregation. That is all hidden from the end user. And we have a plugin architecture, so it's really simple to add new functionality to Intake. So I will swap screens and show you an example. Now, I'm already on time, but uh, <laughs> let's see how quickly this can go. So uh, here is a catalog. It is stored on GitHub. Um, this is fully integrated with FS spec, so we can express our URL like this, and it will find the right thing. I could have put in a specific tag or branch, so that's nice. And I'm going to view this using the built-in catalog. Uh, this takes a moment to come up. Sorry, GUI, I should have said. And in this GUI, we have the new catalog. This is from the Pangeo collaboration. Uh, it's called master. Also, I have some built-ins. So this thing is something that is installed using pip. And I can view the default uh, visualization of this thing. So this is what I was mentioning, that you have this built-in visualization capability. I'll just get rid of that. Um, I can browse down into these catalogs. See. Each catalog has a subcatalog. I can go to that and it has a number of entries. I have no idea what this information is. You can see this, it happens to be Zara, which we were just talking about. I can list all of the sub entries of my catalog and browse through them. I can grab some particular one using familiar Python-like syntax here. I have no idea what this thing is, but it gives you some kind of description. It gives me some metadata, which is the original URL and some tag. And it tells me how it, this basically says how it's going to be loaded. It's a, a this is a SARS thing that's going to be loaded using X-ray. I have search functionality. I can search for all of my catalog to make a new uh, sub catalog of the things that happen to meet it, which are, uh, which are these things. I can look at one of them. I was searching for the um, text time. It's interesting that in this case, uh, it crops up in the middle of a word. So this is a super simple text search. Um, some backend support much more sophisticated searching, depends on what that backend is. The YAML backend is just text. And I can load this thing as a Dask object. This is loading from remote. Uh, where is this thing? I don't even know. It's on, it's on Google. Okay, fine. And it gives me, you know, this is this is a typical data set. I can see this thing is, is 500 gigabytes. I'm not going to load it. Um, but getting to this stage now that I'm ready to do my analysis, and I, um, this is loaded as a, as a Dask. All of these are Dask arrays, so it's ready to go on a Dask cluster if I had one set up, but I don't. And similarly, um, this is now a, uh, a tabular data set, and I bring your attention there are lots of ways to load tables from SQL, from Dremio, from Salesforce, from Spark, whatever it may be. We support all of these different things. This one has just a, a, a couple of, um, of uh, specifications. Here's one of them in text form. And um, there's an interesting extra here. This is set up to be locally cached, which is just as well because I don't have much time to run it. This is now using a locally cached version. Again, to Dask, this is loading Parquet data. We can't see that immediately here. If I had a look at this, um, I could introspect, I suppose I can do that. And it tells me that the plugin is Parquet. Um, I just happen to know that. So uh, this has some millions of rows. I can, I can now do dasky things to it. And this is just using the uh, threaded scheduler to do it. Uh, it's package counts from the Anaconda download service. And we can see that the most downloaded thing for the particular month, which was uh, last month, was OpenSSL, which got downloaded some millions of times. All right, that's the example. And I want to reiterate now that I, I'm out of time that 
EdTech provides all of this functionality so that you get around that thing where you're trying to remember A, which data set, and B, how the hell do I load this thing? You get to put all that into declarative code or into a data service. And uh, once you've done it once, other people don't need to copy and paste code to be able to find that. They get access to that catalog. They can find the thing that they're after. They can load the thing using Dask and you can update uh, the specification as and when required. That's it for me. All right, thanks, Martin. So just like before, um, we have a little bit of time, you know, a little bit more than 15 minutes for questions. So feel free to unmute and ask a question or you can share it in the, in the chat. I will just share my final slide, uh, which is if, if people want to talk about other catalog like things, these are totally in scope. We don't have to just talk about uh, intake. Uh, for example, there are other data services that uh, can be used in conjunction with Dask. There are other loaders that know how to pass their data to Dask. And there's the whole issues of, of structured or nested data, which we touched on earlier, as I wasn't actually expecting. Maybe we want to talk more about that. Yeah. I actually, you know, oh, go ahead. Somebody else should go. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh I was curious about the derived data sets. Um, is, do you just store like a reference to where the derived data set is, 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 is placed or do you also include sort of the, the thing that derived it? Can you, is it possible to store something that would allow you to sort of like treat a derived data set as a, as a virtual data set and only materialize it if you needed to? Uh, so actually that latter is the current model. The, derived data set spec is essentially a function that you can call uh, in a number of different ways. And uh, it's that spec, that function call and all the arguments to it that gets saved into your um, declarative data set. So it will be generated on demand. Having said that, this is Dask, so you can persist it in the Dask cluster. And intake provides a dot persist method or a dot export method so that you can materialize it to files if you want to, but that you need to explicitly want to do that. Well, that's... If you do that, then it will save in the metadata of it where it came from. So you can regenerate it. Um, that whole mechanism works. Um, it could use more smoothness in the user experience, I think. Oh, great. That's like exactly what I was hoping. I'm curious, so how you persist the function for long term, like if it's, you know, you know cloud pickled function or something, it's kind of dangerous, right? Right. So we only use functions that are defined in a module that can be imported. We don't store the code itself in the declaration. Do you save then also say the module package version or something to? Uh, right, so at runtime, it will attempt to import it. And if it's not found, it's not found. So you'll get an import error. Uh, the description of that derived data set ought to tell the user what its requirements are. And even better if you include it into an installable uh, package, whether it's pip or conda, then you can have the code that does the derivation and the uh, declaration of the data sets it's able to make in one place. Excellent. Or you could have the a set of der derivation functions in one package and have your derived data set declarations in a different package that depends on it and, and rely on package management to sort it out. Okay, thanks. It looks like Zaya has his hand raised. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, so for, for writing and I guess, um, deriving because deriving is a right operation. Um, uh, specifically the, the to Dask function, um, what, is, what is Intake's relationship with, uh, with each of the drivers or the, the backends um, in terms of um, mapping? Does each, so, so say you wanna transform into a different, uh, into a different file format, uh, is that something that is supported? Does it need to be supported by, by the backend? Um, uh, what it, it does intake do its own translation and type mapping? I'm trying to understand where it yeah. sits. Uh, so for, for those that know about history, Anaconda tried to solve this everything to everything translation 
problem in the past uh, more than once and it, it is obviously an impossible thing so intake as the name suggests is concentrated on ingesting your data getting your data and once you expose the dask object whether it's a data frame x-ray dask array or streaming object whatever it may be you can do any dasky thing to it including using a writing function to whatever backend you have in mind. Having said that, I mentioned uh, persistent export. In the current implementation in Intake, those support one single file type per container type. So if it's an array, then it will only save to ZAR because that's the one that I happen to know. Uh, so, so that's the current limitation. Um, the registry where these things are stored in intake is dynamic so you could update it but that's not something that's described in any of the documentation uh we yeah we've really tried to stay away from explicitly handling runtime or output just to make things simple um limiting scope is as it is intake has kind of sprawled in scope a bit <laughs> thanks Thanks. Uh, I don't think you answered this exactly. There's a question. Is there an example of a derived data set usage with intake and DAS somewhere that you, that you can uh, point people to? Uh, there is a single doc page on, on the main um, intake site. Let me find it and I'll paste it in a moment. But I am in the process of writing a blog post about this. This was soft launch, so it was available in intake for a couple of months, but I didn't really popularize it because exactly we don't have the examples to show how it should be used. And it may yet be that the API needs some improvement to make it usable for a wide range of use cases. Okay, thanks. So I don't think there's another. I do have a question that I can um, ask. You, 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 you even mentioned, you know, the, the Dask APIs, like Read Parquet, or Read CSV, there are lots of options, right? So um, then you have the two Dask method in intake. Um, how easy is it to uh, customize exactly how you're using the backend there? And like, how does it compare other cases where, you know, you'd want to just um, inspect the source and call Dask, you know, separately and you'll get much better performance or do you in general do a pretty good job? Uh, so the to Dask method will give you a, an instantiated Dask object, but the data source itself knows about the setup arguments that it uses to make that call. And you can override any of them if you wish. Uh, more generally, if you're uh, curating your data set, it's nice to provide as explicit user parameters the things that you think will matter when the user is instantiating so that they, they have that choice and you can visualize it in a GUI so that you can click on the thing if you, if you want to. That sounds nice, yeah. So what about integration with something like Rapids? Like what if you wanted to use Dask Kudia from the backend? Are you able to do that with intake? Uh, at the moment, it will call Dask Read Parquet. So if you had a, a, an engine keyword, then that's where you would put it. If you, if you wanted a different um, Read Parquet function, because it's defined elsewhere, then uh, you would need to write a very similar looking driver to do it. Uh, intake drivers are really easy. So um, it's just a question of people getting around to, to making them. Cool, thanks. All right, looks like there's another question. It says, does intake use cache for data loaded from the cloud to prevent from loading it twice if you run your script many times? So in fact, the example that I had on uh, Conda package downloads was using caching to, to do exactly this thing. Uh, it caches to a some local temporary directory. It will be reused between sessions. Um, but in fact, almost all of the file-based backends use FSSpec, and FSSpec has its own caching layer. So that is now the preferred way to do it, is to uh, specify that your FSSpec URL will include a caching element. And that will enable you to hook into other FS spec related things. So if you do want to load directly using Dask or, or just your own session at some point. Um, and it's a more natural place to put in different cache drivers, if you, if you like, so different ways of managing your cache. At the moment, we only support uh, 
expiring things after a certain time or expiring things after have, we have a certain number of files, um, it would be nice to have a more fully formed caching mechanism that um, it's also possible to check the original to see if it has the same um, ID. Most of the backends provide it, uh, an ID. For example, S3 has an e-tag, that kind of thing. So you can check that to see if the original has updated and download the new version if it has. There are several possibilities there. Again, it's something that I would like to see rounded into a, a, a more complete solution. But I, I do think that in the long term, it should live in FS spec and not in intake itself. At the moment, you have both options. Okay, that makes sense. So if anyone else has questions, feel free to unmute. You can also, you know, if you're feeling shy now, but you have questions later, there is the Slack channel, which you, you can add questions there. Um, And so Martin, since there's just an open, this is an open discussion, do you have any questions for the larger community that, you know, think thoughts on your mind regarding, I guess, anything here? Um, there were a lot of, uh, we internally at Dask have already discussed a, a, a lot of the things that are in flux, such as um, Arrow's data system, uh, the, um, file system interface versus FS spec or in conjunction with FS spec. That's the sort of open thing that will continue to, to develop. Uh, I mentioned FastPack a couple of times. It's going to continue to be supported and developed into the near future. It might go away if we find that there really is no need for a, a, a second option there. Um, I don't know if people have a have thoughts on that. If anybody here actually uses FastPack as opposed to Arrow for for Parquet data, I'd be interested to know it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, more around Arrow. You know, Arrow is going to ha has a whole ecosystem of its own as a sort of monolithic project. And PyData has really been using lots of small projects to do that kind of linkage of lots of different things. So it, it, it remains to be seen how that plays out for the future. Obviously, PyData has not been as interested in multi-language support because it's PyData, um, whereas Arrow very much is. So maybe there's some friction there. I, I think in Dask, we're in a good place to make sure that that friction, if any, is, is lessened because fortunately, be, because of Yoris and other people at Arrow, Arrow cares about what Dask does. So uh, you, you know, uh, keeping it usable from Dask is obviously in all of our interests. That was more of a statement than a question, sorry. <laughs> That's totally fine, I agree. Does anybody have any lingering questions about you know, anything that, that, showed, that came up in this workshop? Feel free to ask. Um, like I said before, we can always uh, you know, have continued discussion in Slack later on. But, and Yoris, if you have any finishing thoughts as well. I could put one up. Um, Great. Can you describe like if you wanted to come in and, and put a plugin underneath intake to interface it with some existing data catalog solution, how would you suggest approaching that problem? Uh, so intake does have a, a dedicated page for describing the process. Essentially, it comes to subclassing the data source class and putting in your custom code for whatever it is. If it's similar to something that already exists, then obviously you can you can copy some of that. Um, if it's a data service that provides many data sources, then you will want to subclass the catalog and that catalog will return entries which create sources. So there is a little bit of learning if you're doing the that higher level. For a, a single file type, let's say, you usually don't need to do that. Um, for exposing it to the world, there is the, the page where you can or you can suggest links to be included in that page. But uh, Intake supports the uh, entry points mechanism. So if your package is installed, then Intake will find it and it will use the, the name there to be able to load that type if it comes across a catalog that claims it 
wants that type, if you see what I mean. So, so there is a, a naming convention. Uh, you can use the name of a, of a driver, or you can explicitly give the long form package.module.class if you want in the spec so that you know what thing is going to load that specific data source. Interesting. Does the catalog, is it possible to subclass it in a way that it can cache the information it's retrieving somehow or convert it to like a YAML? Uh, there is, I, I think the base catalog supports a .yaml method, which will give you a, a YAML representation. Um, Actually, that will give you a YAML representation of how to access the catalog itself. But there's another method whose name esca escapes me that will give you a YAML output. Um, but if you need, if you're considering the need to cache the catalog itself, then it's probably quite large. At some point, the YAML spec is nice for examples, but it's not that scalable. Um, you can, since you have full control over what happens inside your driver, you can specify how that will happen. So you could, if, if you're loading from some files, for example, you might have your specification actually in Parquet, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, or CSV, then you could use FSpec caching to maintain a local copy. Mm -hmm. Or if it's loading from some, uh, for example, we have SQL, we have a Mongo query engine for uh, uh, data specs, then you would need to come up you would need to decide how you think best to cache that information. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I think the YAML is really useful because you could imagine people may have access to a very large catalog but only care about a very small piece about it and they'd rather just save it to YAML and forget about it. Yeah, that's true. So you could do catalog dot search, get a sub catalog of the things that match and save that thing to YAML, yeah. Yeah, that's very nice. I didn't have any uh, closing thoughts, maybe just a small reaction on what uh, Martin said. So in, its, in, in our, we want to support um, multiple um, languages. We want to uh, be cr cross language. It makes it um, part of, of the implementation. Our is certainly less accessible for uh, like, yeah, Python uh, developers. Um, but for something like the Parquet implementation, there is also a lot of value in sharing the low level implementation uh not only shared like with our users but also lots of um, people are directly accessing it through the c++ interface um and yeah i think there is a lot of value in, in sharing low level implementations like that of course there will be a python interface and um for people like dusk or packages like dusk um that's that's what uh, that matters um but maybe to end, I want to thank uh, Martin and uh, Rick for organizing and yeah, and you all for uh, the participation. I think it was a very interesting uh, questions and discussion and presentations. Um, so thanks all. Uh,